Welcome to the show, Vaughn. How you doing today, man? Awesome, man. Thanks for having me on finally. Yeah, uh, looking at my notes, we first talked uh, eight, two and a half months ago. So yeah. I'm, uh, you're a bit, you're a busy guy. Yeah, it's been it's been a good problem. Yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that you. But I, I knew you were a busy guy before all of this. Um, you are a businessman. You own your own business. Um, yep. And you have two kids. Is that correct? That's correct. How old are your kids? So John Boy just turned 14 last week. And the bugalator is 11. <laughs> so a boy and a girl. Yep. All right. Right on. Very cool. Well, um, so how, how have you been managing through this uh, shutdown? And how's that affected business and and What's going on in your life these days? You know, it's, it's affected. It's hit us for sure. Um, but I, I got to tell you, having these relationships I've had with, with my clientele for as long as I have, uh, hearing these stories of these gym owners having to close down because of, you know, COVID and, and the states shutting everybody down. I mean, it it was i've been in this racket for 20 years and march april and half of may hands down were the hardest the hardest time i've ever had in my career um just hearing the story over and over again i mean i know these people personally i know their kids and you hear it over and over and over again and you know, with me being an in insurance, there's no business interruption money to help these guys out because it's a freaking pandemic. It, it's my heart just bleeds for all these guys that that are going through all this stuff. And it, what do you do? You're, you're a chicken caught in a tractor's nuts. You know, you, it's it, it is brutal. I I literally broke down um, at the end of April and, and I just cried like a little baby. I had to get it out. Really had to get it out. And yeah. Yeah. You know, other than that, it, it's been great. I, I'm blessed to have the business that I've, I've, I've developed and all the infrastructure we have, but my heart just bleeds for all these guys that are going through it. Yeah, I think that was the hardest thing for me, talking to business owners, small business owners who were literally day by day trying to navigate uh, if can they survive and if they do, how. and what's the best answer for their family and what's the best answer for their customers. I mean, it's just, it, it was heart wrenching to talk to people in day in and day out. And I know you being in this for so long had a really healthy relationship with a lot of them. I've seen you interacting with your clientele. Um, and I know that they probably, a lot of them are probably reaching out to you, like just even to know how to navigate. I'm imagining. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the business you're in, you're in insurance. Do you do insurance outside of gym insurance? This is I do. Yeah, we, we do. We do all of it. We do healthcare. We do gym insurance. I do contractors, buildings, all that good stuff. So Wow. So tell us how you got into this business. Many men um, inside of our group are, are you know, they're, a lot of them are kind of seeking, like, what do I do? You know, some have been laid off and have asked questions about what they can do um, to earn income. And, you know, owning a business comes up a lot. And you and I both owned businesses, so we know the, the true story. But um, how did you get started? So I'm referred to as the SOB, son of the boss. It's a family-owned <laughs> agency. <laughs> um, so let's see, it would have been 1999. Um, and there was back in those days, there was no way in hell I'm going to be pushing paper, being a freaking insurance agent. Right. Right. So I did flat work forever and a day, still do it. And I was getting ready to start my own flat work concrete company and my credit wasn't very good. So I asked my old man to co-sign for me on an SBA loan so I could start my own flat work business. This is around winter time. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll co-sign for you on one condition, Vonage. You work for me for one winter. 
and um, I've been there ever since. So I used all my, my connections in the contracting world here in Utah. That's how I built my book of business. And in, what was it, 2002, my father introduced me to the gentleman I named my son after. Um, his, his name is John Eusius, and he specialized in, in um, commercial insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So John took me under his wing. I'm talking like a four, at least a four-year mentorship with him. And he taught me the ropes of how to sell underwriters, how to deal with clientele, how to deal with insurers, how to deal with plans, the whole shit match. And that, that was what springboarded me, not only knowledge wise, but having a little thing called confidence um, to, to, do my, to do my job effectively, right? Well, in 2006, same year John Boy was born, he passed away on his Harley. Oh. And that hurt yeah. a lot. That hurt. And when my wife and I, we were just dating at the time, and, and we had a contraception malfunction. And my God, has that been the biggest blessing that could ever happen to me? Um, it was in the infancy of of when Jess told me that she was pregnant, we were doing the old shit drill. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Do you like me? I like you. What do you think? You know? We navigated those waters and decided to get married. Um, shotguns were optional, right? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and um, she asked me, she's like, what, what do you want to name him? And I go, his name's going to be John, 100%. So uh, that, that's how he got his name. And had your, your friend, John, or your mentor had already passed away? Yep. Okay. Yep, passed away that year, a couple months before he was born. Yeah. Yep. What was her thought on that? I mean, you're just you're dropping. Oh, she was 100% on board. Right on. I didn't get any blowback at all, which was, which was awesome. And. And, you know, she's like, I, I would like to have his middle name is her father's name, Eric. And like, done, you know, that's, that's his name, John Eric Vernon. So. So how were the emotions of that? I mean, you're, you're talking about, you just, you had contraception failure. You have an unexpected pregnancy. You're going to get married. A mentor of yours passes away and you, you name your unexpected surprise kid by the name of a mentor that you're still kind of going probably I'm, I'm soon I assume there's still some trauma or some um you know uh, leftovers from losing this this guy that meant a lot to you and, and trained you yeah yeah it, it's it's a neat relationship with that end of the stick uh his kids run uh, their agency about an hour north of where i live and to this day we talk oh wow so you have a good bond with them. yeah absolutely yeah. to this day yep so you ended up getting married. Um, yeah. Was that all you expected it to be? Was it a complete bliss or? Oh my God, bro. So Mike Tyson says it the best. Everybody has a fight plan until they get punched in the face, right? Oh, that's a great um, one. <laughs> so, wow. Let's talk about that. I mean, after John Boy was born, 10 toes, 10 fingers. So that's got that out of the way. That's good. And um, you know, we, she had to work, I had to work to pay the bills and it, it got to the point to where she was so overwhelmed with, with John, it was hard for her to keep her job. And I, I brought it up. I'm like, why, why don't you just hang it up and I'll get off my dead ass and start being the, being the provider. Cause you know, he, he needs you and, and you don't need this, this stress from your job. Um, when you got enough on your plate, right? So that, that was right around late 2006, 2007 is when I started looking and just dab dabbling into the health and fitness industry. My, my book was so big with contractors. So um, 
the first gym that I wrote was a guy by the name of Jeremy Horn, who's an old school UFC guy. And he affiliated with CrossFit. And I went down and grappled with those guys and uh, wrote his account. And then in 2007, um, let me backtrack. I broke my freaking foot doing jujitsu because um, I'm not that very flexible slash agile. <laughs> so uh, that took forever to heal up. And I started looking at other jujitsu gyms and there was another one that was by my house. And so they had uh, Saturday mornings was open mat. So I, I show up there getting ready to, to roll around with dudes and I, I look over in the corner and I see, I didn't know what it, was at, what it was at the time. I see these guys doing Fran. And I'm like, what in the entire hell are these guys putting this up? And little did I know, little did I know that this would become a major part of my life. And uh, got together with the, the gentleman at the time was Damon Stewart. He was the owner of Wasatch CrossFit. And from there on, this, the, the snowball started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When the crash in 2008 happened, my contracting book went to hell in a handbasket. Oh, can't imagine. Yeah. yeah. And then I went full bore in, into the CrossFit world and functional fitness. Wow. And the goal was 250 policies. I'm just going to sit on them and service them. We hit that in 60 days. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So that's that's how that started. Yeah. So you you obviously uh, got 2008. Let's see. Your son was two. Um, you've been married for two years, and you mm -hmm. um, and then your business blows up, and then you blow up another level of your business. It's a yep. pretty crazy couple of years. How were you as? How do you feel you did as a dad in those years? You know, I as I'm embarrassed to admit it. Looking back now. I definitely could have prioritized my time a lot more um, being boots on the ground at the house, helping out with the day in and day out. Um, but that my head wasn't, my head wasn't there. It really wasn't. It was on, on building the book and building the business and looking back, you know, hindsight's always 2020 or whatever. Looking back, I probably wouldn't have changed the thing for where, where we're at right now um, with the trifecta of awesomeness with relationships with my kids, um, my wife and, and, and everything else. I kind of look at it like this, dude, like I, I was pretty much, I was pretty much there on the weekends, right? Yeah. And just slaving away at the office. And looking back, missing that time, um, I can tell you, I can tell you this: that that time does not get skimped on in any way, shape, or form anymore. With the kids. Well, I, I, and I did want to talk about that because I've noticed that about you. Um, but you're you followed a very common path that I think many, many men, especially business owners, follow when their first kids come. There's like this. Uh, or you're freshly married or whatever the case is there. I kind of equate it to, we have this, this overwhelming sense of we've got to over provide. And that means work. Like you just, you just work. And I, I did that. I buried my, my everything into work and lost like a few years. Like I was, I was there on the weekends sometimes. Um, so it's, it's not an uncommon pattern, but one thing I did have noticed with you is that, I mean, I think in the last year, you've done multiple just trips with you and the kids. I mean, maybe there's some other people there, but um, how do you, so, so how have you prioritized? What's the, what's the big thing that you've come away with after, you know, kind of reassessing how that should look? And when did that happen? Kind of walk us through that. So that would have been, I'd say, I really started making this a, a major, major priority in 2013 um, for the fact that 
you know, it's everybody says it, it's so cliche. Where does the time go? Yeah, right. I'll tell you where it goes. It don't stop and it keeps marching on with or without you. And, you know, I, I, I take the mindset of I'm never going to get these years back with my kids. And I'm, I'm going to make memories with my kids going out, enjoying ourselves, having a good time and building, building a relationship with them. You know, I got, realistically, I got, what, another two years before John Boyd pieces out and he wants to be with his friends. Right. Right. You know, Mia's right on his, right on his heels. So I'm, I'm taking full advantage of these next couple of years of any time there's a window, it's on. Yeah. Yep. So one thing that I've talked a lot about uh, inside the group is like just being uh, interested in what they're doing and uh, the fact that if you're doing something when, with them when they're young, it does not mean that they're going to love and do that thing when they move on. And so it sounds like you're kind of preparing for that time, but what is it that you guys enjoy doing? What have you enjoyed doing over through the years? What are some things that have really, you feel like you have the best bonding time? Being around a campfire, just talking story. You know, I can't tell you the in-depth Fortnite conversations we've had around the campfire. <laughs> <laughs> Super high level, deep stuff. Super, you know, and it's, it's that. And, you know, I, I look at it like this too. I've, I've, been, I've had the privilege to coach football for, for a couple of years now. And I see a lot of parents drop their kids off at the field, the damn car pretty much hasn't even stopped and they're just booting them out on the field. And I, I have this conversation every year with coaches. Um, if, if we get about a, a third of these boys conservatively, we get more one-on-one -on -one time with them than their parents do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's a big deal. Being able to be in a position to hopefully influence and help these young men out or give them a little thing called a work ethic and you know hold the whole team thing and stuff like that so yeah man that's that, that's kind of how i look at that for sure yeah have you let's see your your boy is 14 so he probably hasn't given you much kickback yet like no i don't want to go out and go camping or whatever it is not yet what's uh, you you said probably two more years. You think sixteen is when he's gonna sixteen when he gets his driver's license and his buddies and dad's not cool anymore. Right. Right. So um, how about your daughter? Is she like? Do you feel the connection, a dad daughter connection, just as strong as the dad son connection from a guy who doesn't have doesn't have girls? Yeah, she is. I mean. She has got daddy wrapped around her little thing. Of course. And she's, she's daddy's girl. She, she, Mia is a spitfire. She is, I could, not, I could not imagine my life without her. So when she was born, I wanted to put a bullet in my head. Okay, she had colic. Ugh. The hardest, I mean, the hardest three months ever. And Jessica and I had conversations where if, if the roles were flipped, we'd be a one, one kid family. It was that hard. Right. And she's so just hard headed, stubborn and man coming these, these past three years with, with her getting a little bit more mature and it's, I've, I've never felt closer to her. I, yeah. I really haven't. And when we go out, it's so funny when we go out, just me and the kids go out camping or whatever. She is, she's daddy's helper. She wants to hang out. She makes sure I have something to eat, I have a cold drink, you know, <laughs> are you good? Yeah, I'm good, baby. Are you good. What do you want to listen to? Well, let's do this daddy. And it's, it's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. I, I'm debating on either getting into battle axes or really gnarly shotguns for when these, homies start coming around the house wanting to want to hang out with her in a couple of years as well. So I haven't figured out what I'm going to do. 
Yeah, I mean, um, battle axes send a a pretty gnarly message. Uh, I've never heard that one, but man, you could be sharpening it, you could be polishing it, you could be walk them in and show them your collection. Yeah, uh, like, and put a sticker on it that says your name. Yeah, and yeah, here, son, I want you to feel how sharp this edge is. I've really worked this. So, and and then there's this one over here that's really dull. Can you imagine getting hit with that thing? Just bludgeon. <laughs> Because we always joke about, you know, cleaning the shotgun when the boyfriend comes over. And I can't imagine being in those shoes. I think I would literally be the dad wash or cleaning a gun when the boy first boy comes over. Yeah. Like, I, I just, I, I can't, that level of protective uh, mind. Do you think your son will be as protective or protective of her? Is there a way oh, that, time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're thick as thieves. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So what did they do together when they, when they're hanging with their dad like what you got you said camping and i happen to know i think you guys you're in utah which is yep. you know, really unique uh, areas so what tell everybody what you're up to when you're out yeah there. we go down to moab a couple times a year and um take the side by side down and go crawl around the rocks go look at the arches and stuff um there's this place called the san rafael swell it's uh we don't know if you ever heard of goblin valley or not it's down it's beautiful this is a beautiful country so, you know, a lot of it is unplugging from the damn phone, literally going out to places where there is no cell service. So dialogue is happening. I think that's they're, really they're not doing this shit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I've always wondered um, how, you know, when, when you have your own business, that is no matter what, if there's service, there is like a, in, irresistible pull at least once a day to check it yeah. and um and so you have you found that just powerful like you're just completely able to unplug or is it Boy, you, that's you, that's a skill set in itself because your brain never shuts off right that's what it i never say. shuts off mm -hmm. um the first time when was it i want to say I think it was about three years ago. I went for two weeks without touching an email or a phone call, nothing. Gave the keys to the car to the staff. I'm out. Obviously lined them out with the training protocols, what we do. And like the first four days, it was all I could do not to, not to call and check in. Want, want to see how everybody was doing, right? Right. Fifth day come around, I'm like, you know what? You, you've worked for this. Let's, let's see if it works. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy your time. Let's see if it works. Well, go back into the office. Didn't skip a beat. The world did not. Didn't skip a beat. The, the wrong world. direction. Absolutely. And, you know, that is a lot of where you're at up here. Yeah. You know? And, yeah, that, that three days sucked. I could you want to be you want to have your hands on everything you want to be that control free because it's your baby what's going on what's going on what's going on right but now it's it's great where I went up uh, my in-laws live in Buffalo New York and and they came out in July and we did 10 days up in Island Park in West Yellowstone I didn't touch an email or a phone call or a text yeah yeah so you're getting better at it over time yep and and it's amazing how I don't know if you, I, I put it as refinement for the soul of getting the hell out of the trenches, going, enjoying your time with your loved ones, people who you care about and knowing everything's going to be fine when you get back. And if it's not, it'll be fixed. Yeah. Well, I think there's a, a message that is sent when you are doing quote unquote family time and you're constantly checking your phone. The message is you're, and whether you, you mean it or not, is maybe you're not as important as what everything else that's going on, you know? And that makes it, um, it, it that hurts when I think about that. <laughs> yeah, so. We're all guilty of it. Yeah, I think it's a- it, 100%. It's something we, we have to talk, talk about. And then the other element is, you know, getting kids off the technology as well. 
yeah. that they're seeing another another aspect. I think where you live, it's incredible to be able to show them the those natural beauties that all that very amazing erosion and um, the things that it's created. That's a pretty unique situation. Um, so, what has been the most difficult? timeline of being a parent i mean I, I i think i know because you you expressed your colicky daughter <laughs> no was that was that the toughest that's the the creme de la creme for sure yeah second yep. second top challenge second second biggest challenge boy i don't know there's a lot of them. i'd say everybody's got their their past with how they were raised you know some people jive with what their old man did some people don't and i was raised so i'm i have five little brothers and sisters right i was the guinea pig and i was raised with an iron fist 100 percent had to with with six freaking vernons in the house it, it's a it's a, like a diet coke version of a of a penitentiary right a prison yard so <laughs> if you ain't if you ain't running shit with an iron fist it's gonna it's gonna go off the rails quick so i would find where in certain situations when the kids disobeyed or they didn't clean the room or they did something to piss off mom boom here comes you know what my dad would do to us to yeah. me Right. And taking those, how do you want to word that? Taking, taking those lenses off and having another thought process, another truth of how we can go around what I have experienced in my life experience and use other tactics and other ways to to express your disapproval has been that's number two hands down yeah that's yeah. number two hands down. it's tough to navigate i mean we are you know men super emotional not emotional but super quick to anger i think would be the word get upset lash out uh why are you doing this stupid thing and it takes a ton of skill to redirect our brains stop slow down and make it a, a learning a learning opportunity, I, you know, is what you try to turn all of those into. So you spoke about how you were raised. Um, when you, when you have these magic, let's say you have some magic goggles and you're able to look, you, you passed on and your kids are now raising kids or their, their kids are raising kids. What are some traits that you would want to see that you would walk away going, wow, okay, that carried on. And I'm so happy about that. You know, I, I, number one would be um, the relationship John and me have together as siblings. I, I hope that never gets tarnished because the way they are, the way they have been the past couple of years, it has been a huge payday for Vaughn, mm -hmm. 100%. And being, being a good person, being a productive person, having compassion for people, you know, it's so easy to look down and criticize it ain't easy to build up. You get that skill set to build up, build up people, your loved ones around you. You're, in my opinion, that is success. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, do you, uh, that's really good. Do you still have a relationship with your, your parents? Let's talk about that. <clears throat> I've, I've actually been thinking about this for a long time, for two months, how I'm going to, how I'm going to talk Working with family is difficult. My father gave me an opportunity down at the agency, and thank God it's worked out. My two little brothers worked out at the agency as well. Okay. Everybody in my family starts with the V. So there's me, Belene, Vince, Valerie, Vic, and Vanessa. Wow, lots of V's. Like lots of V's. I tried to keep the V thing going with John. Vladimir was the front runner until that whole thing happened with my mentor and that, that got the kibosh. Yep. Um, but my, I, I'm going to, I'm going to bullshit you. 
working at that agency has affected my relationship with my dad. 100%. Yeah. And I beat myself up over, I'm actually going to count. Mm -hmm. And it's not what it used to be. When before, like in the infancy of the, of the agency, it was awesome, it was great. And then we started having growing pains and power struggles and all the political tape with family, all that stuff. You know, I'm my family's strict LDS. I'm the black sheep of the family. I don't, that's not my jam. And I get that thrown in my face to this day. And it is, it's, it, it's, it's hard. I don't, I don't lash out. I don't, I, I don't feed the, into the question. I, I, I just, I just turn around and walk away. And I know my dad loves me with all of his heart and he wants the best for me. And in his eyes, that is the best. Cause when my old man grew up, my old man's from Pennsylvania, from um, the mining towns there near, near Swickley. And he had a rough, rough upbringing. And the church pretty much saved his life. He converted to the LDS faith when he was 21. I mean, he was out of control. Mm -hmm. And he served an LDS mission to the Philippines in the early 70s for two years. Um, came back to BYU, met my mom, who's from Boise, Idaho. Talk about opposites attract. <laughs> and, and the rest is history. Now, when I, when I said earlier about having other thoughts, having other processes of disciplining the kids, um, it's that's the way my dad was raised. He didn't want to go. Right. Right. And borderline abusive home, dude. And, you know, with, with the, with his belief in the faith and me not subscribing to it, he, he wants to go ham and, you know, let's, let's get this going, man. Let's get this going. Just, just, just sliding it in just ever so slightly all the time. And, you know, that's one of the many things, but where I, and you guys really first came out with this, with this brothership this brotherhood i gotta tell you this has given me the initiative to fix to fix me inside so i can have a loving relationship with my dad and i hope to god my relationship when when john is my age and i'm my dad's age i hope to god the relationship isn't like where i'm at right now with my dad and i'm working to fix it. I know it takes two. Yeah, it does. That's, that's incredible. And, um, I commend you for at, at the age we're at, if we are fixing something with someone, there's usually a lot of history of pain and hurt right. and it's, it's not a quick fix. Um, it's dude, it's, it's eating an elephant a bite at a time and it's a big freaking elephant. Yeah. Yeah. And when it's, you know, when it's one person working on it, and I, I do talk about this a lot. The only thing you have that you can control is your own actions, feelings. Right. And, um, and it, it is hard to watch. Maybe, I don't know if your dad's working on it or not, but you know, it, it's a very difficult thing, but man, is it worth it? Like knowing that you, I'm sure when your father passes away, knowing that you did everything you could to fix that, it's gotta be, you know, I did what I needed to do and there's no regrets. And, um, I love that. I love that. I'm doing everything I can to not have that happen with my own kids. That's a. That's a. I, I want to drive that point home. Is some men get stuck in the fact, you know, my parents were horrible, or I didn't have a dad. I don't know how to do this thing. Well, that's that's giving up. That's that's resigning to family uh, history that you're just going to repeat. And it's it's inspiring to hear that. Hey, things haven't been great, but my whole uh, my whole heart and mind are in improving this for the next generation i think okay. that's i think that's incredible um do your kids see that it's a fractured relationship with your with your father it's it's weird so my dad literally lives 10 minutes away from my house okay yep and 
my kids might see my mom on their birthdays, my mom and dad on their birthdays and the holidays, and that's about it. And my in-laws, so where, where we live, um, they built a cottage in the back of our lot. My in-laws come from um, December to April, and you would not believe the difference of the interaction my kids have with my in-laws versus my kids have with my parents. It is, it is night and day different. Night and day different. And, you know, I'm going to own it. A lot of it's, a lot of it's me. I, I can do a better job of calling my parents up. Hey, let's go, let's go do something. Hey, let's go drive up. Hey, let's go hang out. But it ain't there yet. Yeah. It ain't there yet, but yeah. I'm working on it. Yeah, and I, I would imagine at some point it would it would feel a little awkward at first, and that would be obvious as well, right? So there's got to sure. be a repair prior to that. Well, sure, I 100%. really appreciate. Here's the thing, I really appreciate your candor because, one hundred percent, know that somebody listening is dealing with something extremely similar, or is not even close to where you're at, and needs to hear that this needs to happen sooner than later. And that's really the important thing is sharing the message that if there's a fractured relationship, you know, uh, the time to fix it is now. There's no, no reason to live in regret. So what would your advice be to some, someone that's 10 years your youth or you know, just starting a family and there's a fractured relationship? What would you say to somebody? Every day is a gift. That's what I'm gonna say. Every day is a gift. And if you even get that little feeling inside your soul where God, I should probably reach out or man, it sure would be nice if we could hang out more over the holidays without butt heads or I wonder if we want to go golfing. Just anything. Yeah. Time's the most valuable asset we have here on this earth. How are you going to use it? You know, that's, that's what I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. I know that there's someone that needs to hear that. I know it. And um, man, I just, I tell you what, I can't thank you enough for sharing that uh, the, the tough parts and, the, and then the absolute joy, which is you and your kids, like hearing you talk about your kids and how you love it is, is um, it's very motivating. It's, it's like, for me, it's extremely motivating. Grab them and go somewhere, go, go do something. Cause we could, I, you know, I'm intentional with the time. Uh, like I see them every day and like I need, there's a point where I just need to set everything down and just focus in and listen while I still can. Um, but I, I love that, that unplug and that it's almost like you have to force it to happen because I imagine when it's happened once or twice, the magic will draw you back. Well, it's, un it's unbelievable. The, yeah, you're right. Once they're a day off, once they're a day off of freaking electronics and you start talking, you start dialogue, you make jokes, you know, you have fun, you laugh. It's, they're different people. They're different kids. Yeah. hundred percent different kids. Yeah. Does your wife go on with these on with you on these trips? Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a family affair. It's, it's a family. It's, it's about, it's about 50, 50. I've had the conversation with Jess of, you know, I, I'm going would you, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to hang out with your girlfriends? You want to go? She's like, no, take the kids. So you, it's, it's, you know, she gets a cherry pick the good trips. Ah, good for her. <laughs> <laughs> she don't like getting scared down to Moab with all those big, big obstacles and stuff. So that, that ain't her jam. So yeah, that's kid, That's our, that's our, our favorite trip with that's, the kids for sure. So. That's incredible. Well, I think there's several really powerful lessons in, from this talk. I mean, like, I just really, um, I feel, I feel blessed to have talked to you about this today. It was from someone, someone who's coming from uh, an, uh, an amazing relationship with his father. And um, it, it helps for me to see, you know, give, get a peer inside because I think that where you're at is more common than where I'm at. And, um, and 
one thing I know is that men often think they're suffering alone in something. And the more that men are willing to share what they're going through, the more we realize that we aren't and that there, this brotherhood is a place to uh, be safe and learn from other men who are steps ahead or are going through something. And um, I, just, I just appreciate you just giving a, a gift to many, many people. And I hope it, that listeners wholeheartedly pay attention and do what they need to do to repair, repair relationships and stop and dive headfirst into unplugged time with their kids where you're forced to get back to the real heart of a relationship. So that's, that's, I, I got to tell you, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, the work you guys are doing with this project is absolute gold. How many, how many fathers, how many men, let's be real. How many fathers, how many men, want to open up and be vulnerable nobody does that shit hurts really hurts. you know and it is it is so nice to have this resource and this community where nobody is gonna get attacked ridiculed whatever you want to call it it's it's a breath of fresh air it really is helping helping people out yeah and I, I really love what you guys are doing I appreciate it. Well, th thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing, for opening up so that other men can feel comfortable doing that. We, um, man, I really appreciate it. Oh yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Hey everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this, uh, great episode with my friend Vaughn and, um, do me a favor and go rate this podcast right now where you're feeling super emotional. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll capitalize on that for sure. So rate our podcast, so give us a subscribe, listen to the stories so that you too can experience growth and be a better father, be a better parent, be a better husband, because in the end, those things are what matters. And uh, hey, if you have any questions, just reach out to me, scott at brotherhoodfatherhood.com or josh at brotherhoodfatherhood.com. We are here to help. If you haven't done so, uh, Vaughn referred to the Brotherhood of Fatherhood Facebook group. Hop in there and uh, fill out this, the questions. We want you in that group so that you can be filled up and have those resources. Thank you for being a listener.